So for our second case, we're staying in Colorado. And this is where we have what I would say is a bizarre update on the case of a missing mom, 49-year-old Suzanne Morphew. It has now been 10 months since Suzanne disappeared. Her husband, Barry Morphew, has reportedly sold the family home for $1.62 million. Now, the reason this is curious, I'm not even going to say suspicious, because the husband, we want to be absolutely clear here, the husband has not been named a person of interest, a suspect, nothing, nothing by police. Okay, so let's just, you can all speculate all you want, but in no way has he been named anything in relation to the disappearance of his wife. But here's why it's curious, because the last time that Suzanne was reportedly last seen alive, was in that very home and by her husband. She was last seen on the morning of Mother's Day, May 10th of 2020. The husband told police that he saw her right before he left for Denver to go on a business trip. He has a landscaping job. The couple lived in the home with their two adult daughters, Mallory and Macy. And Barry, the husband, says... Uh, this is what he told the Daily Mail and several news reporters who came around asking, why are you selling the house? And Barry said, look, I want to get rid of this house because my daughters are terrified that their mother was actually kidnapped, abducted from this very home. It is really scaring them. It has them unnerved. So I want to get out of here. And you know what, Mike? I kind of can understand that but your face yeah, indicates yeah. otherwise. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I'm with you. I mean, how many of us would be a little bit creeped out by that? But how many also would think this is the one anchor point that this woman has, if there's any chance she's alive, do I really want to pull that away? Um, I think back of during like the Elizabeth Smart investigation and how the family continually pounded the drum, that we're at home, we're here, we're ready we, we, they, they wanted any effort to say there was a way that if Elizabeth were to hear a message that that family knew her, they loved her, they remembered her, they're waiting for her, her bedroom is still there, you know, and all of a sudden they're just pulling the rug out from under this woman. I, I know of a mom right now in southern New Jersey, a case that I covered 30 years ago. That little boy has never been found, and his mother is sitting in that same house 30 years later, and she won't move from that house because if, any, if he's still alive and there's any chance, she needs to know that he has a place to go, that he knows exactly where he lives. I can't. Countless, yeah. countless families who will never leave the home for fear that the person will show up to that location. And what if, God forbid, they're not there to help them, right? So that's how most yeah. families of missing people deal with this, but not all, okay? And I get it. Maybe they don't want to be in this house. And they're like, you know what? Mom's a grown woman and she would know how to find us. And she has family and she could go here and she could go there. So, you know, let's say I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because what else is it other than curious? It's, it's not criminal by any means. Now, the FBI reportedly searched this house, this house that has been sold, twice after Suzanne disappeared. Barry told police that he believes Suzanne may have gone on a bike ride sometime after he left. Thing is, nobody remembers seeing Suzanne on a bike, and then later the bike was discovered on, uh, the bike was discovered abandoned on a trail not far from the home. Suzanne was reported missing after her daughters, Mallory and Macy, were unable to contact her. They were out of state on a camping trip. The daughters called a friend and said, hey, can you go check on mom? The friend tries to check on mom, can't find mom, and it's the friend who actually calls police to say yeah. that Suzanne is missing, which is a little curious when you have a significant other, a husband, and but it's, it's interesting. Um, so Andrew Mormon, who is Suzanne's brother, believes that his sister was abducted and something horrible happened to her, and he just doesn't believe that she would leave the family. 
and just like go off on her own. And it, there's been no indication or sign of life. And here's the other thing. For a while there, the uh, a, a theory was floated. You know, the husband w- was part of this theory. Maybe she was attacked by an animal and killed. I suppose that's possible. Yeah. But there are no signs of any kind of a vicious attack. And most animals who attack, you know, they don't eat at all. They would leave something. Yeah, I mean, let let, let me just jump in on this because I'm just itching in my seat right go, now. Go, go, Th- This was so frustrating to me, the, the mountain lion theory. And, and it was so frustrating that I reached out to the Mountain Lion Foundation and I brought two biologists onto our program of, at Profiling Evil. And I said, let's talk about the behavior of a mountain lion. We actually used GIS. And we said, what is the historic distance that a mountain lion would drag its prey once it got it to hide it? Because a mountain lion's personality is to do exactly what you said. And, and this is kind of more morbid, but to chew a little bit on this thing and then hide it, bury it under some brush and other things and come back to it. It's always going to do that within about 150 yards where this kill site or attack site happens. And it's always going to be downhill and toward water if there's water. So it starts really limiting this area of possibility if, in fact, the mountain lion attacked Suzanne. But there was no physical evidence to support any of that. And, uh, and you know, I asked them outright, and I had them show examples of other animals that had been killed by mountain lions. It is not a pristine site free of blood or torn clothing or scratch marks or drag marks. So that was absolutely baloney. What's your involvement in this case? Well, we were we were really fortunate because we were like you, just kind of listening and watching and talking a little bit about it. And Andy Mormon actually reached out and said, I want to put a search together because it's not happening locally. Can you help me? And so we we stepped in and we said we'd absolutely help. And we used some GIS and, and outfitted uh, up to 700 searchers that he arranged for to track them in real time as they searched areas so that we could provide the sheriff and the Colorado Bureau of Investigations a footprint of every piece of dirt that somebody walked and checked. We um, we helped him with setting up a GoFundMe page that got him money to help pay for people's lodging and food while they were searching, which was really troubling to us because the family had set up a GoFundMe page that's never been accessed, never been had an expenditure come out of that we've been able to see. Which so, family? Because there are many families oh, sorry, involved yeah. here, right? And and let's make clear for anyone following along that Andy is Suzanne's brother, right? Yes. The, the missing woman's brother. And when you say family, there's the husband's side of the family. Because, you know, depending on who you talk to, you get a different picture. You have Suzanne's brother, who's very suspicious and concerned and is doing things like this, uh, supporting searches and cadaver searches, which we're going to get into. And then you have um, the family of the husband who says, you know what? These two were madly in love. Uh, they were a great family, a great couple. This is shocking. So, yeah. okay, so, so, so for, please go ahead. Yeah. So thank you for clarifying that because Suzanne's husband and family on his side of the fence set up a GoFundMe page that grew quite rapidly. And the, and the uh, parameters of that were to pay for things like searches and, and uh, this ongoing effort to find Suzanne. When Andy Mormon, her brother, asked for some of those funds to put together a search, he was denied any access to that and set up his own GoFundMe that he used to pay for people that were coming in, to pay for lodging, to pay for food and water and other kinds of things. He paid his own way. uh, And uh, I thought that was so impressive. He didn't use the GoFundMe money for that. He used it to look for his sister. He brought his dad on and we talked with Jean, her father, about uh, Suzanne. We did what I think is really important that hasn't been done. We, we, talked about the victimology. Who is Suzanne Mormon? Uh, What made her, Mormon Morphew, by the way, um, what made her this incredible human being? And, uh, and, you know, it's just, we saw these complete polar opposites. And and, uh, again, it's not an indictment on Suzanne's husband or her daughters, but they remained quiet 
and mom and her family, her brothers and sister stepped up and said, let's do this. Let's look for this woman. And it was just really troubling. And I oftentimes still cite Elizabeth Smart, whose mom and dad every single day was on the front of the news saying, help us find our daughter. We got a 30 second clip from her side of the family or from the husband's side. Well, let's be fair, in all fairness, that the husband did put together this video clip that says, Suzanne, if you're out there or anything, uh, what he offered a, a reward, a sizable reward. He He's offering a $200,000 reward for his wife's safe return. Yeah. And what you're you're suspicious and skeptical. No, no, no. I think it's so admirable that he would do that. I'm I'm troubled because uh, some people deal with grief much differently than others. And that's why I put this comparison of, of Ed and, and uh, Ed Smart, for instance, who every day is in front of the press saying, help me find my daughter. Kelsey Schelling's mom, who every day is saying, help me find my daughter. And then we have someone on Suzanne's side that doesn't do anything. And her family, brothers and sisters have to step up to organize a search. This isn't necessarily an indictment on Suzanne's husband or anyone else. Some people handle grief differently. It's just troubling because on the outside, as we look in, we see one side of the family saying, help me, help me, help me. Another side selling off property and moving away and moving on. Yes, I do want to talk about about the property as well. Here, here, and here's another rift between Suzanne's brother and Suzanne's husband. Suzanne's brother wants the husband to take a police polygraph test. The brother says that the husband has twice refused. This has been reported by the Daily Mail. The husband says he's cooperating and has not been asked to take one. Honestly, I don't know which one is accurate. Do you? I don't either. And, you know, that's another interesting thing and, and a place where I think law enforcement could do a better job. The, this chief, for instance, in California City on the little boys that are missing, the West boys, was in front of the press every day saying, yes, we asked for a polygraph. No, I can't share the information on what the result was. Um, we're not getting that out of Salida and the sheriff's office there. It's very quiet there. And the family and, frankly, the public need to know a little more. I think that that's reasonable. I think that that's reasonable. Now, the as we said, that we've got two versions and two families, the, the, the Suzanne side and then the husband side of the family. What um, Let's talk, I do want to talk about the properties for sale but I also want to talk about what happened that night. I'm, I'm torn. I'm not sure which way to go. Okay, I'm going to go with the properties for sale. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to go out of order here. Okay. So we know that the house has been sold, right? Here's what is also very curious. Suzanne's husband, Barry, recently sold another piece of property. This is just a two-acre piece of vacant land. And he sold it last month for $150,000, which is less than he paid for it a year earlier. Less than a year. Wait a minute. When did he buy this property? He bought this property after Suzanne disappeared. Now, that's not unusual. But what is curious is, is this not the land where her brother paid to bring in cadaver dogs? Yeah, and actually he didn't pay. Those were volunteer cadaver dogs uh, out of New Mexico that have been proven and have found bodies in Colorado. And uh, they they did alert in that same piece of property. Law enforcement came out and did search it and were unable to find anything. And some people have theorized a bunch of reasons why that may have happened, but it was, in fact, the same piece of property. And it was resold to the person he bought it from for $15,000 less. So originally, he bought it from the developer of this uh, long Longhorn division or whatever. And he sold it back to the actual owner is from what I've been able to see on the property records. Uh, and, you know, he was smart enough to to buy it back for less than he sold it for. But, but yeah, what we see again is this... Uh, to me, this washing of hands of getting rid of all of my assets and responsibilities in an area 
for what reason? Who knows? Maybe to just go off and start a new life where people may not know who he is. He could also be short of cash. Could be. Uh, that's Although a possibility. With, with the sale of his house and his ability to, to maneuver through the conservatorship, he now has a bucket load of cash. So I don't know that that's necessarily a problem. Can you shed any light on the fact that he sold the house and Suzanne's name was on title as well? So how do you sell a house when someone's name is on there, but you can't locate them? You know, I found a couple of things that were kind of interesting. One was when they purchased the home um, several years earlier in 2018, uh, they actually purchased it and the documents went through without some key signatures because at the first of this year, they had to issue another warranty deed to fix a problem that occurred in 2018 where someone forgot to sign all the paperwork. And uh, and so they, number one, they fixed that on February 3rd. And, uh, and then four minutes, six minutes later, they then put in this uh, certificate of registration to to recognize a protective order from Indiana. So he actually had guardianship uh, awarded in Indiana. Colorado accepted that conservatorship. And uh, and then in that very same minute that they accepted that, they they uh, submitted all the paperwork and then and finished the health sale. So in effect, he lost, well, he made $50,000 on the house sale. He lost 15000 on the Longhorn property sale. But by the time he plays real estate fees and, and whatever improvements he made on the property, he's probably going to lose quite a bit of money on the Puma Path property. But since he's got the conservatorship now and beat the system, he actually has a bucket load of money. So. Mike, you really lost me on the whole conservatorship oh, thing. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? D is she declared dead or she didn't have to sign for the sale? What does that mean? So um, it's it's a lot of legal that I don't understand. And and uh, But what happened is he got conservatorship of, of Suzanne's uh, holdings in Indiana. He then filed with those same conservator papers in Colorado, and Colorado accepted the guardianship of Suzanne from Indiana, which gave him guardianship in Colorado to sell the house and take the assets. So it's kind of like a legal way to go ahead, and uh, conservatorship sounds like the live version of uh, an executor for a will, kind of like the whole Britney Spears thing. Her father's the executor is in charge of all of her finances and legal things and how that's working its way through. Is is that fairly accurate? Well, yeah, and I, and I am no legal mind. I have just asked lawyers in Colorado to help me understand what's going on with this, and that's kind of the description I got. But what we do have are the actual documents that are public record that show this certificate of registration and recognition of a protective order from another state, in this case, Indiana, which then gives um, Barry the authority to sign for and in behalf of Suzanne and lead to that house sale. Very interesting. You the man who profiles, you read anything into this or this is just a guy figuring out how to sell the house that is girls can't stand? Yeah, I mean, it, it very well may be. And and hopefully it just becomes a way for him to continue to to fight to find his wife. And and uh, um, gosh, I, I don't know. It's it's interesting that that he has to go through these hoops to do that, because in some states I uh, my understanding is they would have to wait a period of five or seven years to be able to do that. He found a way to to avoid that. Yes, it's the speed in which sometimes things are done that I always find curious. Yeah. So let's talk about the last time Barry and Suzanne saw each other based on the reporting of the Daily Mail. They reported that on the night before Suzanne vanished, that Barry spent the evening at a hotel, budget hotel. I don't know why that's so important that it's a budget hotel. Um, budget hotel in Denver. And that when he left the room, the room was reeking of chlorine. Okay, it is, there is a pandemic. 
I'm just going to toss that out there. A man named Jeff Puckett, who's 49 years old, is a co-worker of Barry's, said that he was ordered to Denver by Barry that morning, but didn't see him because he had already left the motel room because of a family emergency. Jeff told the DailyMail.com, quote, I got there Saturday night and the room smelled like chlorine real bad and that there were wet towels everywhere. Okay, well, that kind of sounds like a motel room, wet towels everywhere. The manager at the property confirmed to the Daily Mail that they do not use chlorine to clean guest rooms, but I might say it's not a bad idea, Um, (laughs) and that (laughs) they handed security footage from that weekend to the police. Jeff, the co-worker, also said that he discovered a pile of mail in the room, including a letter about property insurance, and later turned that over to the FBI. I don't know whether that's significant in any way. And to be clear, the sheriff's office has not named any suspects or persons of interest. No arrests have been made. And Suzanne's case is still classified as a missing persons case. What do you make of the Daily Mail's reporting? Yeah, I, from what I've learned, it, it I don't think is quite accurate. Uh, Lauren Sharp, a reporter in the area, um, made a, a, a really nice uh, report and showed in the interview with Puckett and a female employee. The female employee recalled hearing Barry's truck outside of her residence at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning on the morning of Mother's Day. Um, they had been given orders to drive that day, Mother's Day, uh, the employees to Denver to do this surprise job. Now, I've heard that he checked in the night before, but that doesn't coincide with her testimony or his saying, I left at 5 a.m. and headed to Denver. Um, that's when he says he last saw Suzanne was at 5 a.m. as he's heading out to go to Denver. Uh, it wasn't even a budget motel. It was actually, I think, uh, like a, a, a like a Hampton Inn or Fairfield Inn kind of a yeah, hotel. Yeah, those so, are great places. <laughs> yeah, that's where Crime Watch Daily always put me up. I always <laughs> loved it. Free breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it, and actually, if you look at the property, it's a brand new hotel, so it's not a budget hotel like no, they suggest. I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. know. You, you know, I sometimes I think it's the perspective if people maybe from other countries or something like that how they view our hotels, but those are fine hotels. Absolutely. But but that's the weird thing is it's Mother's Day. So is this normal behavior for him to just get up and leave on a Mother's Day? Is it normal for the kids to be sent away to, to church camp over Mother's Day? You All say sent things. away. You're very I'm I'm you're parsing your words and I'm listening to every one of them. Sent away? What does that mean? What do you well, mean by that? It, it, there was there was apparently a church camp or something that the girls were involved with. So it could have been, you know, absolutely and they're, these are older girls. They they could have absolutely wanted to do this. Coming home on Mother's Day, uh, I don't want to have anything read into that that comment other than they were away, and then he suddenly gets up and drives away. The thing that becomes so interesting are um, the little pieces of evidence that suggest that there was texting going on between Suzanne and a friend the night before, that there's frustration, there's concerns, and then all of a sudden there's behavioral changes in the texts. And Andy Mormon talks about his sister actually starts trying to friend his friends on Facebook, which is completely out of character for her at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night on the ninth, the night before Mother's Day. So you start looking at all those kinds of things and you just say, how normal is it that this guy on Mother's Day would go do work and drive away on Mother's Day. Um, How normal is it that his daughters would call and say, hey, we can't reach mom. That makes really good sense. We're trying to wish her Mother's Day. So he calls the neighbor and says, hey, go check out the house and see if you can find her. The neighbor says, can't find her. And then he says, oh, well, maybe go check and see if her bike's there because she likes to go bike riding. Well, those are just really interesting things because she goes back and the bike's missing now, and that leads to this search and and the discovery of the bicycle and, and then the four theories on what may have happened. So you just look at all those and you say, wow, how, how coincidental or how perfectly planned are these things? I don't know, but she's been missing for 10 months and there's no sign of her. So I don't read anything positive or good into that. 
Yeah, and and I don't see anybody looking, but I'm not living in Salida. I just hear people from Salida who say, uh, other than the people, it doesn't appear a lot's happening. Hmm. Very, very suspicious. Well, again, sheriffs have said clearly, though, that they have not ruled out foul play. And um, there is something that's interesting about the husband, Barry. He recently did some television interviews. He said he was very frustrated. People were saying nasty things about him, and he didn't like it. It was time to speak up. So um, also what he has said is, this is what Barry, the husband, says about the police. Quote, the police. The police have screwed this whole thing up from the beginning, and now they're trying to cover it up and blame it on me. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm just going to leave it there because we've got nowhere else to go with it. Yeah, it's interesting when when um, we quit thinking about Suzanne and we think about our own victimization instead. I don't know. You don't like it. I, it's just I don't. I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew him and the daughters, so that I could just kind of in my own mind say, "Is this normal?" Because for the rest of us, it just doesn't seem like normal behavior. But it might be absolutely normal for that family the way they're acting. 